so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode contains discussions of hate crimes and suicide. If this is triggering for you, give this one a miss. Between the beaches of Bondi and Tamarama, in Sydney's picturesque eastern suburbs, lies a steep cliff face. Parks and a walking track sit above, attracting tourists from all over the world. But below is rock and the white, foamy Pacific Ocean, the water appearing black at night time. In the 1980s, there was no railing separating the track from the steep cliff. And at night, sometimes screams were heard by locals. Bloodstains were found along the walkway. And in the very worst case scenarios, men disappeared, or their lifeless bodies were found below. Lives cut tragically short. Some locals nicknamed the area Bondi Badlands, a spot that turned into what's been referred to as a killer's playground. So what was happening to these innocent men? And why did it take so long for police to give these crimes the time and energy they always deserved? I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with journalist Greg Callahan about his investigation into a series of brutal murders that took place along the cliff tops between Bondi and Tamarama Beach in Sydney's eastern suburbs, a stretch that's become known as Bondi Badlands. It's July 1989 and a newsreader named Ross Warren appears to be missing. What were his last known movements? Ross Warren every couple of weeks would come up to Sydney. He worked for Win TV in Wollongong and he was based there and he had quite a big following in the Illawarra region. He was, you know, he's the sort of guy that people would recognise in the street and come up and say hello. So he had a pretty high profile. But this was 1989. He was a gay man. He was in the closet. The management at Wynn didn't know he was gay. He was at an interesting point in his career because he'd been at Wynn. He'd developed this very loyal following for over a two-year period. And he was actually having chats with uh, Network Brass in Sydney. His dream was to work on a major network in Sydney as a newsreader, preferably, or a weather guy. So, you know, it was an interesting point of his life and every two weeks, every second Friday, he would drive up to Sydney where he had many friends and he would uh, enjoy the nightlife of Sydney and go out as you do when you're, you know, a young man. He was staying with a friend, as you say, and he didn't come home. What were the first steps in terms of finding out where he was? What actually happened was he came and was staying with a friend of his, Craig Ellis, who at the time lived in a two-storey terrace in Redfern. And on that Friday night, they had dinner and then he asked them whether they wanted to come into Oxford Street with him and a a mate of his from Wynn. So he went out on the town with his colleague from Wynn TV. They were there on Oxford Street until about two-ish in the morning then Ross got in his car and, and drove off. He headed towards Bondi, back, not back to Redfern, and he drove to Bondi to Fletcher Street, which is very near Mark's Park. People who know Bondi would know it well. Parked there and uh, walked down the steps to the cliffside walkway and was never seen again. What did police, once they eventually became involved, what did they believe happened to him? The police at the time made sounds about doing an investigation. You know, there was mention of police divers. There was mention of, you know, a really big investigation of the headland itself for any clues. But it didn't seem to happen. There's no real evidence even that Warren's car was dusted for fingerprints at the time. So 
it kind of fell to Ross's friends, Craig Ellis. Craig Ellis is the one I just mentioned who he'd be staying with in Redfern. And Craig was a very good friend and he knew Ross that well that this was completely out of character. He just doesn't not tell people where he is. By the Saturday afternoon, they had gone to Paddington Police Station and had reported him as a missing person and that was pretty much they were told, you know, you've got to wait another day or so before we can really act on this. Bondi Police didn't seem to be terribly interested, but what the boys did, Craig Ellis and his partner, they drove down to the headland. Craig had actually met Ross on the headland about a year or so earlier, just over a year earlier, and he was like everyone, perplexed what had happened to Ross, why he didn't come home on that Saturday morning. And uh, they took a drive down to Bondi and pulled up rather spookily in Fletcher Street and right ahead of them was Ross's car. Four months after a body was found at the bottom of the Bondi Tamarama Cliffs, what do we know about what happened to John Russell? Ross Warren disappeared on the headland on a freezing night in July 1989. Only four months later, another man, John Russell, who'd been a barman for years and years, but most recently had sort of been working a couple of part-time jobs. Pretty exciting moment in his life, actually. He just inherited a lot of money from his maternal grandfather. And he was about to leave Bondi, where he'd grown up and spent, you know, all his life, basically and move on to his dad's property in Wollombi. So John, 31-year-old, who was due to have his birthday the following Tuesday, was out having drinks with his best mate at the old Bondi Hotel. Again, locals would know the old Bondi Hotel, a sort of wedding cake of a building sort of built in the uh, first part of the 20th century. So he was having uh, drinks there with his mate and then then around 11, between 11 and 12, they kind of called it quits and John went for his walk and Dino, his mate, who was headed off to the bus stop to go back to Surrey Hills where he lived at the time, looked back and he noticed John crossing the road, crossing Campbell Parade and wondered, well, he should be turning right, going back to the apartment. So he didn't really think very much of it. But John walked on the headland that night and we don't know why because as far as we know with John, he didn't frequent beats. So his family members, and I'm inclined to agree with him, think that he went for a walk to kind of say goodbye to Bondi because this was the last few days he had there. This was a place where he grew up, a place he loved. He loved the beach. So we firmly suspect that he actually just went for a a walk and it was a beautiful night. It was hot and it was fairly windy, but it was a lovely night for this cliffside walk and um, it was tragic what happened. Was there evidence found at the scene as opposed to Ross Warren where it was as though he vanished? With John Russell, what was there that could indicate what happened to him that night? There was quite a bit of evidence and unfortunately some of it was lost and some of it was ignored. The most obvious thing was in his left hand, John's body was lying at the bottom of the cliffs on the Bondi side of the headland, not too far, about eight minutes or so walk from the Bondi icebergs. In his left hand, he was holding some blonde hair that didn't match his own. And that was bagged at the crime scene. And then, you know, the investigation such as it was didn't really unveil very much. As a detective who picked up the investigation years and years later found that the bag and the hair went missing, which was a crucial piece of evidence because it obviously contained DNA. There were other things that suggested foul play. The most obvious thing too that you could have almost seen from space was the position of the body. If John had stumbled drunkenly along the cliff face and there wasn't any railing in those days, cliffside railing, which is unlikely because he never had a record of getting so drunk anyway. He wasn't a huge drinker. He enjoyed a beer but he never got to that stage of being stupid drunk. Never did that. So that's unlikely, and the suicide just didn't fit at all. He had absolutely no history of depression. He was at a moment, as I said earlier, he had everything to look forward to in his life. He was looking forward to travelling around Australia, building this house on his dad's property, 
a really big change, very exciting change for him. So it, there's no reason why he was going to kill himself. But these were the conclusions the police came to at the time. Okay, they came to those conclusions, but they also ignored this basic thing that was right in front of them, and that was the position of the body. If indeed John had tried to kill himself, or if indeed he'd kind of stumbled over, his head would have been facing out to sea. That's the way that gravity works and the mm. way that he would have fallen if you know his death was attributed to those things. His body was in a very strange position. His body was actually facing the headland. To get into that position, he would have had to, while he was falling, twist himself into a 120-degree kind of twist, if you like, and fall, which is extremely, extremely unlikely. This was kind of ignored. Interestingly, you know, it was one of the first things the Detective Sergeant Steve Page, who picked up this investigation in, uh, in the early 2000s, it was one of the first things he noticed on the crime scene photographs. He thought... <laughs> That's not right, you know. And he actually had it checked out by people who know these things and they did a reenactment of Russell's death or fall from the cliff face a bit later. And although that was mainly staged as a publicity kind of draw card, they wanted to get people to come forward after seeing it on the evening news. It did also sort of demonstrate that just by the nature of a fall like that, that the position of the body was highly suspicious. So you've got someone who, as you say, ended up in that position and had a fistful of someone else's hair. Was that the official call that they just went, yep, this is a man who fell or died by suicide? Well, unfortunately it was. I think the first inquest into John's death lasted no more than about 30-odd minutes. A proper investigation wasn't launched. That's the bottom line with it. His death didn't get the respect of a proper investigation at the time. You wouldn't even call it an investigation, really. They actually put his clothes on a dummy outside the police station to try and identify him because what happened was that John had actually lost his wallet the week before he was killed. And so what he had in his pocket that night was his uh, packet of cigarettes and he'd very carefully put his National Australia Bank card tucked it behind the foil in the police packet. When the police found that, they traced him through his credit card, of course, but he had his old address on it, his grandfather's, where he'd been living with his grandfather's house earlier, but he'd moved from there. So it took them a little while to actually track down John's brother and family. In the meantime, they decided for whatever reason to put these clothes on a dummy in front of the police station, and then they dry clean those clothes so vital forensic evidence was lost. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary lack of proper police professionalism. And, you know, not all police or cops were as dismissive of a gay murder in those days. I know that for a fact. And we have people in the podcast who were around at that time and really did care about these murders. Nothing was done by the Bondi police. Can you describe this area. So there's Ross Warren, there's John Russell. This strip in Bondi, what was it known for at the time? What kind of history did it have? Well, the headland of Bondi is remarkably beautiful. It's basically a, a rocky headland, pretty similar to a lot of headlands right down the east coast of Australia. It's capped by a park called Mark's Park, which is a sort of a grassy verge with trees and shrubs. Today, there aren't so many trees. Back in those days, there was a lot more vegetation. That vegetation proved a very good screen for a couple of reasons. The perpetrators, the killers, would often hide behind the vegetation and it would give them an opportunity to see who was walking along the pathway and pick their easy targets. There was that, but also the place, the headland, had been a gay beat for decades and the vegetation there provided a kind of an enclosure of privacy. So for both the victims and the perpetrators, the headland was a kind of, hate to use the word, it's a bit of a cliche, but the perfect killing field in a way. There was another murder in July 1990 which took place around those Bondi clifftops after a man and his companion were attacked. Were police able to determine what happened to that victim? 
Yes, that was a very interesting case. That was a Thai man who'd been working in a Bondi restaurant as a dishwasher, kind of a gentle soul. He'd only been in Australia for about four months and, you know, came from a very conservative village in northern Thailand and he was just amazed by the openness and the tolerance of Sydney or the seeming openness and tolerance anyway. We don't know a lot about Krichikorn, unfortunately, because he'd only been in Australia four months. He didn't have many friends. His family were from a village in northern Thailand. They didn't know what to make of the circumstances of his death and they really didn't do press. His sister was in Sydney at one stage, Krichikorn's sister, but his death was a particularly gruesome one. Him and his companion were basically bashed and hunted like animals and I'm certainly not saying that animals should be treated in that fashion. No sentient being should be treated like that. But according to the defence, they claimed he staggered along the cliff edge and fell backwards. So when he did fall backwards, he fell onto a ledge below the cliff and he was there for an unknown period of time. It could have been several hours and then he fell to another ledge before falling into the ocean. And the terribly grim aspect of this is that when he hit the water, he was still alive. He may have been unconscious or semi-conscious, but he was still alive. Was it accepted that this was a hate crime, that he had been hunted because of his sexuality? Well, back in 1989, the term hate crime, gay hate crime, wasn't really in use. It wasn't a term that was used. Basically, One police officer at the time, Sergeant Steve McCann, he started joining the dots between the murders and he came to the conclusion there were gay hate killers out there, but the term gay hate wasn't necessarily used in those days. It was pretty obvious to people within the LGBT community that there was this huge anti-gay crime spree going on. And when I say the word anti-gay, I mean it advisedly because it was predominantly gay men who were attacked. But, you know, trans people were as well and lesbians were too. It's not exclusively a victimology of gay men, but it was predominantly gay men who were the victims at that time. Unfortunately, as I say, Marks Park and the Clifftops provided the perfect spot to kill somebody because they were, although they were right and smack in the middle of Bondi, the geography of itself is pretty isolated. So, you know, not many people in those days went on the headland at night because it was a dangerous place. You know, people were being bashed on a weekly basis and and not just gay men, I might add, too, because although these gangs are out targeting gay men, they sometimes mistook heterosexual men for being gay just, you know, if they had trendy clothes on or they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But Mark's Park itself had been a beat decades before the, any notion of a, of a gay bar or a gay venue. It was where gay men, closeted men, bisexual men and married men would go. So it had a, a long history there. And, and what happened in, in the late 1980s is a combination of things is that the beats became better known to these gangs. They knew where they were. The gay community at that time had a much higher profile Oxford Street was kind of bursting into life. The gay and lesbian Mardi Gras was attracting huge numbers by the late 80s for the first time, massive crowds of half a million or so. There was a huge stigma of AIDS. So these killers had, in their minds, a reason to bash and kill gay men because they saw them as the spreaders of the plague, if you like. So unfortunately at this time, a unfortunate confluence of of factors that led to this crime spree. And believe me, it was a crime spree. Since I've been recording this podcast, I've lost count of the number of people who have called me and said, this happened to me, this happened to me, this friend of mine was killed. Outside of the cases that I'm already dealing with, there was this huge amount of violence. People were being bashed. These gangs were sometimes locals, sometimes out-of-towners. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with journalist Greg Callahan about a series of brutal hate murders that took place in Sydney's eastern suburbs in the late 1980s. 
Do you think that the police failing to investigate or properly investigate some of these cases was a result of their own homophobia or their own fear? Like, why is it that someone is beaten up or in the case of John Russell and and Ross Warren, killed and this wasn't a priority for police at the time? I think ultimately the police force, like any public service, only reflects society. So there was an entrenched homophobia at that time. But what surprises me is that, you know, regardless of that, have a duty to perform a professional investigation. And the case of Ross Warren and John Russell, whose deaths and disappearance were investigated by the Bondo police, there was no proper investigation. That was found very clearly in an inquest in the early 2000s. There was an absolute lack of investigative response to those killings. But that wasn't the case for all police officers at the time. Pritchard Corn, Ratana Jarathapur, and the Thai man I mentioned, his murder was investigated by Steve McCann. Steve did an, an amazing job. The killers were arrested within a matter of weeks and they were in jail within, I think, 18 months or two years. So there were good investigations at that time. It's just that there were very few of them. There were only really good investigations were more the exception than the rule. I think at that time there was a real belief that the life of a gay man didn't count as much as the life of a heterosexual man. Now, if you can imagine that if John Russell was heterosexual and if he was walking the clifftops that night with his girlfriend and they were attacked and they threw him off the cliff, there'd be absolute, absolute public outrage and the police would be pushed into doing a really thorough, granular investigation, but it just didn't happen. And I I think, as you say, it reflected community attitudes at the time, but it reflected also this deep homophobia in some elements of the police force. Incidentally, it's interesting because Steve McCann, who led the investigation into Critchacor and Ratana Jarathapurn, and incidentally, he was with Waverley Police, not Bondi Police. But was a big difference in those days. Critchacorn's murder was investigated by a top draw detective who was really seeking justice. And Steve McCann also investigated the murder of another man uh, in Alexandria Park in that same year called Richard Johnson. And that too resulted in arrests and convictions and jail time for the killers. But Steve Page, who picked up the investigation into John Russell and Ross Warren's death because Steve McCann retired from the force not long or left the force not long after he was successful in these earlier investigations in the early 90s, when Steve picked them up in the, Steve Page, that is, the two Steves, picked up the investigation in the early 2000s, he was really, you know, seeing all the connections and connecting the dots between these various crimes at the time. We have a pretty significant interview in the final episode of Bondi Badlands with a police officer who was witness to police bashing gay men at that time. So it does give you an insight into the prejudices that exist at that time, but then there were terrific police officers like Steve McCann and further down the track Steve Page came along. These were good people, good detectives, detectives with conscience, detectives who were really wanting to do their job properly. There were other men whose names came up and it wasn't necessarily along that exact strip in Bondi but around Sydney like Richard Johnson and Wayne Tonks. What happened to them and were their perpetrators ever convicted? Steve McCann led the investigation into the murder of Richard Johnson in Alexandria Park in 1990. Incidentally, there'd been an earlier murder in exactly the same spot in Alexandria Park of a former school teacher called William Allen. Steve McCann led the investigation into Richard Johnson's murder and they were later to be called the Alexandria Eight, the eight young men who were charged and convicted with that murder. The Wayne Tonks killing was a little bit of an outlier at that time, not in the sense of a gay man being murdered, but it didn't fit the profile of the other murders in as much as it wasn't a gay hate gang. It was a couple of young men who basically decided that they had it in for Wayne Tonks. So Wayne Tonks was murdered by two young men in his apartment in Artarman. It wasn't a gang killing in the same way as most of the others were across Sydney at the time. What do we know about these predominantly young men who were responsible for these 
crimes. What could possibly have motivated them? Oh, look, it's, you know, that's, um, we could talk for hours about that subject. I think basically every study has shown that the cohort of the population that has the least empathy are teenage boys, you know, and there'd been a rite of passage for young men called poof de bashing from the 1960s through up until probably the late 90s. It was a very common word in the vernacular in those days, and it was a rite of passage. It was a way for them to prove themselves. And, you know, a bunch of young men in a pack, they go along with their peers. They don't want to come across as weak or feminine in any way. So they join in on on the violence. The more aggressive ones, the ones that lean towards sociopathy, are the leaders, the ringleaders, and the, the others follow. Well, they weren't all young men, by the way. There were a few young women who were along to some of these bashings in particular. They were the girlfriends of some of the boys and part of the gang. There are a few of them. You know, these people went on to, you know, have families themselves. So you do wonder what kind of parents they've been, really. Something that has come up in your work is the gay panic defence, which is something that was used at the time in courtrooms. What does that mean and how was it used? Oh, the gay panic defence you know, had been used as a kind of good old-fashioned way of getting killers of gay men off prison terms, basically. That had been going on for decades and was pretty much changed by the late 1990s. But it was still being used in the early 90s. One example of that is the murder of Morris McCarty, a technician with the Australian Ballet, who was bashed to death in his home in Newtown, Sydney. His killer sort of ransacked the place, took his car, and it's a bit of a silly thing to do, really, because he was caught very quickly and he was arrested. And in the actual trial, he was found guilty of murder, but that was used, the kind of, oh, you know, I can't possibly deal with a gay man making a sexual overture to me. I'm going to bash him to death or I'm going to, you know, let out my aggression on him. And this psychology, this way of thinking was was playing out in the courtrooms. But having said that, he was by a jury found guilty who didn't buy that argument in the end, but wait for it, he was acquitted on appeal. So, wow. you know, what do you make of that? You know, it's staggering. That doesn't still exist, does it? Has that been thrown out, the gay panic defence? It's more of a stratagem than anything. It's something that what it's about is appealing to the prejudices of men about, oh, you know, how would I react if a gay man made a, you know, a pass at me? I don't know the legal technicalities now, but I don't think that it would be allowed by any judge. Lastly... What do you think needs to be done from here to ensure that justice is achieved for these men? Do you think that for John Russell and for Ross Warren that we will be able to find out who did this to them? Is there any chance that there will be people convicted for those crimes? I think that there is a possibility. It may come very late. Some of these killers have already died from various things. Some of them have served prison terms for other crimes. It's not surprising that, you know, they've been involved with drugs, break and enters and so forth. So some of them have served time for other things, ironically not for their greatest crime of all, taking the life of an innocent person. I do think that there's always that hope. But the first thing we need there is a judicial inquiry into the murders. There was a parliamentary inquiry the findings of which were released earlier this year, and there was a recommendation that a judicial inquiry be followed up. And what that will do is that it will involve a judge who can basically bring people to the courtroom, make them testify, bring these murders to the public for again and possibly reopen some of these investigations. These people were killed. They deserve a proper investigation. Social justice has progressed a long way since the late 1980s and you know, we owe it to these men. Greg Callahan is an author and journalist with 30 years' experience. He's written for most of the major newspapers and magazines in Australia and is currently the deputy editor of The Good Weekend magazine in the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Greg also hosts the Bondi Badlands podcast 
and has been writing about the murders that took place on the southern headland at Bondi since the early 2000s. If you want to hear his full investigation into these murders, you can find a link to the Bondi Badlands podcast in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you've enjoyed today's episode or you have a suggestion for a case we should cover, let us know. Send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au or you can join our True Crime Conversations Facebook group and tag us there. I'll be back next week with another episode, but in the meantime, if you'd like to hear more from me, you can find me on Mamma Mia Out Loud three times a week, as well as Cancelled, a podcast about who's in, who's out, and who cares in the world of celebrities. <laughs>